Bible study. We're going to be myth busting a little few things about angels tonight. And this take a little while for us to get this whole study done. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our Bible study. Father God, tonight in Jesus' most powerful name, Lord, I just want to praise you as, as the opportunity that you've provided for me to be pastor of these wonderful people. I thank you that we're here tonight, Father, and, and, and we're, we're, we're together and we're fellowshipping. Um, Father, we thank you that in spite of COVID, Father, we just we push through and we trust you with all those results and things like that. Father, pray you keep us safe. We pray for the needs that the church and the people watching this have. And Lord, I pray be with us tonight as we get into this study, that we that our minds would be open and, and receptive and that we would learn some things and that, Father, it would have an effect on our walk with you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 So this evening, let me, let me make sure that we are working. Every once in a while it doesn't work and it's not fun. It is working, so I'm happy. All right. So... This evening, we're going to talk a little bit more about angels. Last week, we, we talked just a little bit about angels. Um, there's several topics that we can bring up about angels and that we can address. And then one thing that I realized kind of in the middle of this, there'll be maybe, maybe next week, it would be a good opportunity for, let's just talk about the angelic hosts, and let's just talk about the hosts of heaven, as they're called in the Bible, and just some things that we can learn from what the Bible tells. Now, we're not supposed to live our life aimed at angels or thinking about angels all the time that's why they're just barely mentioned in scripture but they are mentioned so we're just going to kind of reflect on that just a little bit so tonight uh, we're going to deal with with one of the one of the with a few of the things that we think about when we think about angels and then we're going to look at some scripture that the verse that the verses in in bible say about it so when we think of angels anybody think of that yeah, yeah. what do we call that cherub. cherub next week i'm going to describe cherubs nothing like that nothing like that at all if, if we were to see one we'd probably pass out or die of fear um and then we have um another one if, anybody know this one everybody anybody got that picture don't raise your hand <laughs> but that's a famous picture too is it showing up right everybody sees this picture and we see that we know exactly what's watching over the kids don't we it is a an angel a guardian angel so we're going to look at that not tonight but but in, in our future studies and this is another thing we may think of when we see angels you know there's statuary of angels that you know when we think of angels this is kind of what comes to mind in most people's have y'all noticed something that's a common thread in those wings, wings yes um you know the, the wings are there and um i don't know what uh, do i use the word gender uh, i'm assuming most little cherubs you see are little boys so a lot of times they got a little bow and arrow with them. You know, they induce infatuation in people. So anyway, they're also, these are also feminine in representation. And we can't talk about angels and not talk about that. The Bible also maybe mentions that there's another side to it, maybe fallen angels. We've heard of those too. And, and, and this is just an artist's rendering. But you can see it's just kind of, it's kind of dark and it's kind of like, yeah, so there is another side. So, so here's what we're talking about. We're talking about the supernatural realm. We're talking about the unseen realm. Uh, one of the things that we don't see is we don't generally, I've never met, I've met a few people that said they've seen things, but I've never seen an angel, um, but, but I don't doubt that they're around, do you? The Bible tells us that they're there, the Bible describes them as being innumerable. Uh, one of the things the Bible says about uh, God is he's the Lord of hosts, and of that host, we think about the, the supernatural realm or the unseen realm. So let, let's jump into that tonight uh, some things some heavenly beings i want to stick with that tonight and you'll see when i get there why i do that so let's just call them heavenly beings well in the in the in the bible there are listed uh cherub which is singular you've heard of cherubim whenever you see hebrew word and the ims on the end of it, that means it's plural so a cherub is singular cherubim is plural there's seraphs seraphim you've heard of those uh, one being singular one being plural and then there's the, the Hebrew word malak, uh, which is also it's a direct equivalent to the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. So angelos is the word we get angel from. It means messenger. They have a role. And I guess if you were going to classify them, and I've seen people classify angels and name a whole bunch more in these different things, uh, people would probably put like the, the seraphs are considered um, guardians messengers they're considered guardian um heavenly beings they're like the throne guardians and and so and they're 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 extremely strange and next week we'll see some pictures of what people artists have rendered of of them how they look and we're going to look at their role given to us in scripture 
Uh, cherubim are also considered guardians, and, and whenever cherubs, cherubim show up in Scripture, it usually has to do with like entering into a sacred place or, or like in the Garden of Eden. And when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he placed the cherubim there. Um, cherubim, so how many were there? More than one. And they placed to protect the garden to keep the humans out of the garden, although there is some other thoughts on that, and we'll get into that next week. So malak or angelos means messenger, and, and sometimes it is anybody who's sent at, with a task from God. So it could be a human being that could be called angelos or malak in Scripture because it just means messenger, has a task to do. And then Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 3, he talks about powers and principalities and rulers in the high places. And so those are also mentioned. So, so what we have when we think about heavenly beings when we think about the unseen realm, um, there's an order. There's, there's a hierarchy that's considered. And sometimes they're called princes. Um, if you'll remember, when Daniel began to pray, he, uh, Gabriel was sent to Daniel. And it took him 21 days to get there because the prince of Persia, which is an angelic being, let's just say an angelic or heavenly being, uh, stopped him from doing his task. They actually got into combat over that. And said, Michael, the high priest, the prince of priest, prince of Israel came over and took over in the battle so Gabriel could go on and do what he needed to do with Daniel. Daniel had been praying 21 days before Gabriel got there. And then when he got finished, he says, I'm going to go back and finish battling with the prince of Persia. So the scripture kind of lets us understand that there are some sort of heavenly beings that uh, are geographically maybe assigned. And so an angel study, a heavenly being, uh, unseen realm study is a vast study and it's, I think, eye-opening. It's one of my studies that I've been involved in probably since I was little because I've always liked those kind of things. And so I've always looked and studied and, and, and gone on. So, so what are some things that we can, we can look at tonight? Maybe some myths that we can bust. Um, you remember the pictures. And, and, and so one of the things that when we see angels represented in Scripture, you're having trouble seeing, aren't you, sister? When we tilt that TV, then they won't be able to see. <laughs> um, we need two TVs, don't we? Maybe, maybe one day or a bigger Project, projected on, on the wall. So in the scripture, when angels or malak are mentioned, um, whenever they show up and they're named as angels, um, they're always male in appearance. Now, don't hear me say that they're men, because they're not. Um, they're complete different, but they're always described in a male appearance. That doesn't mean that there's no female angels. That's not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm simply saying, once, once you get on that side, male and female is not really a situation that they're dealing with. Remember what Jesus said when they were trying to figure out about which brother was going to be married to the lady when she finally died and went to heaven. Jesus said, you, you err in not knowing the scriptures because when we get to heaven, when we get to God's realm, then we're going to be like the angels in heaven, which are not given or taken in marriage. So that's an interesting study in itself as well. So, so in the Bible, no text um, has an angel described as having wings either. And that's an interesting thing. And there are very, very few texts. You know, you know the Christmas song? Hark the herald sing. Well, if you look at the scripture, it says, Hark the herald, herald angels say. They're not necessarily singing for that, but it's a great Christmas song. And so a lot of times we have attributed a lot of things to angels that may not be true. I mean, there's an interesting study uh, just in itself on what is what does the Bible say about a guardian angel, which is actually very little. But we'll look into that as we go on. So, so consider a few verses, and then we'll have some discussion after this. So in Genesis 18, 2, um, when Abraham was in his tent on the plain uh, before Sodom and Gomorrah, you're familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah package, passage, right? So Abraham's in, in the flap of his tent in the cool of the day, and he looks up. So as it says, lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing. Um, Genesis 18, 2 um, says he, I've got that in there twice. It says, he lifted up his eyes and looked before him, but three men were standing in front of him, and he saw them and ran from his tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. Now, if you're familiar with that study, you know that three men walk up on Abraham, and they're just kind of passing by, and Abraham says, come on in, let me cook something for you, let me make something for you. And he has, he said, has Sarah prepare a dish, and, they're, and they, you know, they're, they're making this meal, which is common for that era in that time. In the heat of the day, nobody's out walking around, so everybody was kind to everybody they met. So Abraham, but he knew something about them because he, he bowed himself to them. He understood who they were. At one point, he, he, he calls them my Lord. And so he understands, and, and the word Lord in the Old Testament and a lot of times it just means master. It doesn't necessarily mean God. 
But that's one of those words we've shoved together. It's like Jesus is, you know, Jesus' name is not Jesus Christ Lord. That's not three first, middle, and last name. He's Jesus. He's Christ, which means Messiah, and he's Lord, which means Master. So those are, those are titles. Um, so he goes and he bows down to them. But, but just in reference, it's, it's three men. They walk up, and the Bible never says anything about they flew up or they, they showed up and it's just three men that were walking. And, and I believe that one of those was, uh, was Yahweh. I believe that it was God himself with a couple of his maybe high messengers that were coming with him. And you remember the plan was he had heard the cry of the unrighteousness coming up from Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities in the plain. And he was going to go down to see if these things are so. And then they have their meal. They sat down. And then it's interesting because Yahweh says, um, do I do this thing I'm going to do and not tell Abraham about it? And so he's appeared in a man's form and he's talking to Abraham in his tent. Like, what an amazing story that is that so many times we just read over. But those two angels, if you want, went on down into Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know the story now about Lot when he get, they get there and knock on the door and Lot brings them in, tries to protect them from the, the men of the city and, and those things. And... Um, and we know that those angels had to get him out before they could then destroy the city. So three men show up to Abraham's flat. Ezekiel 9, 2, and it says, Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen and a, and a riding case at his waist. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Here's another time when they're preparing to go do things. Um, to go to battle, to go to war. You remember Joshua at Jericho. Do you remember he looked out and there was a man standing there? And it was the captain of the, it was captain of the host, right? Because he said, are you for us or for them? And he said, neither. But as captain of the host of the Lord, I'm now come. And he never did really say, if I'm on your side or against you. And, and um, there he was standing, appearing, appearing as a man. Joshua thought it was a man. He didn't think it was an angel. And a lot of times when they show up, they just show up. They look like us. Matter of fact, Hebrews goes on and says that we can entertain angels unaware. That we're not even, we don't even realize that they're in the midst, in the mix of the things that are going on. And those are the stories that you hear today. You hear t t today's stories about, you know, there was a wreck and, and you know, there's some guy there. They don't know where he came from or what he was doing, but he helped in the wreck situation. They look up to thank him and he's gone. And you hear those kind of stories all the time, how angels are involved. Now, remember we looked last week that in Hebrews, the Bible actually says that they're ministering spirits to those that are going to inherit salvation. So one of the main purposes of, of the angels, which are kind of down on the list as far as the order of the principalities and powers, they're here to minister to us. Remember when Jesus went into the wilderness, he was out there fasting for 40 days. And when it was over with, after the temptation and all that that came from Satan, when it was over with, it said angels ministered unto him. Remember, Jesus came and was fully human and fully, fully divine at the same time. But he had those, those struggles that, that human beings would have as far as being in a body and things like that. And the angels ministered to Jesus. So they're ministering. But a lot of times when we think of angels, we always come up with a certain picture in our head. Now, there's nothing wrong with that picture. There's, there's nothing wrong because... Again, when it comes to angels, uh, male and female is not a delineating thing. You know, my main thinking tonight is simply um, we don't see angels with wings. Now, we do see creatures with wings, and we're going to get to, into those next week. And, and the way they're described, they're pretty, pretty magnificent. Another verse to consider is in Luke 2, um, 2 through 4, and it says, And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. So you know where we're at, right? We're at the resurrection of Jesus. Now, John actually says there was an angel there. But I wanted to read you this passage. It said, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Again, it never really says that they have wings. You know, that would be easy to pick out if you walked outside and there was a creature standing in the parking lot with big wings and dazzling apparel. You'd probably say right off the bat, well, that's an angel. You, you can almost identify them because we've been programmed We've been trained through um, pictures and songs and these things of our life. That, and that's, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this Mythbuster study is just so we can go back and say, what does the scripture actually say? 
There's nothing wrong with, uh, if, if you've got a picture of an angel that you like, that, that, like that angel walking across those bridges with those two kids, I think it teaches a story that is relevant to God. He watches over us, he protects us, he keeps us safe. And I'm not trying to take those things away from people that have those pictures that have great meaning to them, but I want everybody to be aware of what the scripture says about angels. And, and there's, you know, again, not a lot of cases. So two men stood by them. How are they described? As two men. It doesn't say that there, there, were, there were two men with cloven hooves and wings and a sword out and, and all those different things. Uh, another one to consider is in Daniel 8, 15 and 16. It says, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having an appearance of a man. Now, Daniel's kind of letting us into just a little bit here. He had the appearance of a man, but he knew something was different about this person. And behold, there stood one having the appearance of a man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So now we've actually got an angel that has an identifiable name. Now, there are lots of lists of names of angels um, that you hear. But in Scripture, in Scripture, what we consider the holy writings, you, it talks about Michael, and it talks about Gabriel. And the Bible actually calls Michael in the New Testament an archangel. So we know that there's ranking in the angels. Michael is actually an archangel, which is above. He's, he's an angel above, and he's also the prince of the people of Israel. So he was given Israel as his ward, so to speak. He looks over them. Now, a lot of people call, a lot of people will say there's three archangels. Gabriel, although the Bible never calls Gabriel an archangel, Gabriel shows up kind of as the mouthpiece of God. Michael, because he's actually called an archangel. And then you'll also hear people say that Lucifer was an archangel before he fell. I've heard this explained to me. I've, I've heard it in sermons. I don't know that I believe all that. I don't know that I would, that I would call Lucifer an archangel. I, and Well, that's a whole other conversation itself. So let's, let's just say Satan. I don't know that I would call Satan an archangel or necessarily a fallen angel, although we do know there are fallen angels because the Bible tells us that Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels, and there was a great war in heaven. So we know that from Revelation, that, that that's a thing, that there are opposing angels, and they're innumerable. A third of the angels, if you, if you do the math right, if Revelation is telling us that specifically, a third of the angels went with Satan when he fell. So that's an interesting spiritual war that's going on around us at all times. I mean, it's, it's a real spiritual war that's been going on. And so you hear that there's a man's voice that speaks, and it's, I believe that this is God speaking. And he says, Gabriel, make this man understand. So we know that he goes on and explains the time of the Jewish future to Daniel. And that's what we have in the book of Daniel. He's, he's explaining the things that are going to happen to uh, the Jewish nation. In Daniel 10, we have another picture, same individual. Uh, it says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, behold, a man clothed in linen. So here we have a man, he's clothed in linen this time, um, with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. So he's, he's a man standing there in fine linen, which kind of gives you the idea um, of bleached out or white. Sometimes the raiment is even considered to glow. Um, with a golden girdle or golden belt around. His body was like beryl. And his face, so he looked like a gemstone. His, his body was like a gemstone and, and like the appearance of lightning. So you got this glory that's coming off this, this individual that looks like a man. Um, the appearance of lightning, and it says his flame, his eyes were like flaming torches. So, so we're getting a little bit, you know, they can appear obviously in different forms, in, in different ways, and we see this represented. Um, his arms and his legs were like the gleam of burnished bronze. So, so you think about bronze and it shined up and it just kind of glowing. And the sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. Um, it also talks about um, sometimes the feet looked like hoofs. So you, you got this, especially when, when we're talking about the cherubim, the, the feet looked like hoofs, but that's a whole other creature altogether. So, so you see, when this creature spoke, it sounded like... Um, a sound of a multitude. So you almost get an idea of like, you, you ever heard people speak in unison and it's just kind of a, it's an interesting din of voices all saying the same thing. And so this is how it's being presented here in the book of Daniel that when this creature spoke, who looked like a man, but wasn't dressed like a man, he only looked like a man in form, so let's say humanoid, because he glowed, he looked like burnished bronze, he had, he had torches for eyes, 
that would be a little bit alarming, wouldn't it? And, and, and we're told later on that, you know, this is, this is the, the same angel that came to Daniel earlier speaking to him again, but he comes and he appears in a different form. So that's the thing about them. They can appear. Now think about it, This is the unseen realm. A lot of people don't think about this, especially today. It seemed like we thought about it more in, in days gone by, but, but what's in this room with us right now? Everybody that came in this room tonight is a born-again believer. God himself came in the room with us. God doesn't live there. He lives here. And so that building over there stays empty all the time. God's not waiting for us to show up. It's not like the tabernacle or the temple of the Old Testament and the early New Testament. God lives in us now. We're now the temple. So anywhere we go, God's with us. Uh, so you, know, you, hear, you hear people say all the time, you know, I've got my guardian angel to protect me. Well, we, God lives in you. So whatever the angel's role is and God's role in all that, but God gives his counsel, if you will, his angelic counsel, his heavenly counsel. He gives them roles. And we're part of their role. They're, they're here to watch over us. They're here to minister us. So, so think about it. When, when you get down in the dumps or when you get overwhelmed in this world or, or when, you, when you cry out to God, how many times are angels involved and how many times do we not maybe receive the ministering that they're here to offer? Because a lot of times we, we look at ourselves to solve our problems. And, and you think about what God has ordained that we can't see. It's in this room right now. So if you think about it, could there be angels in this room right now? Yes. If that chair slides sideways, you'll believe me, won't you? <laughs> I'm going out that door. But, but, but think about that. In this room right now, God is here in the, way, but in the way of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Angels are organized to minister to us, those that are going to inherit salvation. I inherited salvation through Jesus. I'm now a child of God through that salvation. So angels are ministering to us. Um, I think a lot of times they, they, not that they speak through me, but they encourage me. I've told you I'm an introvert. I know you don't believe that, but it really is true. But, but the Holy Spirit has empowered me to speak. But I also think that angels are ministering at the same time. Well, if God's here, who else could be here? I'm preaching the word of God and I'm calling Jesus Christ Lord. I say, died on the cross for my sins and anybody in the world that believes that will be saved. Not a message Satan or of his minions, if we'll use that word, likes. And, and, I, and one of the things that they do, and I, I really, people say, well, I've never seen demonic activity because a lot of times we're wanting to see um, weird things happen, you know, manifest in the parking lot and, and, and those kinds of, you know, I don't, I don't, a lot of people don't believe in Satan today. But, but if Satan was going to mess with America, a, a, a country that used to say in God we trust, right? Still says it on our money, and I think that's because that's actually our God, the dollar. And I think that's why that's on there. Not, not the original intent, that's what it's become, right? I think he's real effective in what he does. Have y'all looked around at America? Have you looked at the conflict and the stirring and the, the constant distrust and it just seems like there's there's all this shady stuff that that's going on and people don't know what to believe about anything and it's a supernatural battle that we're involved in that's why the bible says put on your armor you know put on there for the helmet of salvation you, you know you're saved and and that helmet protects that you know he can't get in your head and 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 convince you that you're not loved by god and you know the breastplate of righteousness that's imputed by christ and then, and then our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and you know the the, the shield of the, the the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. All these things are listed. Why do we need armor? Why do we need God's armor that Isaiah talks about? And then Paul reiterates and changes it just a little bit in Ephesians. Why do we need God's armor if there's nothing to it? If if there's nothing to it, why 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 is all this given to us in Scripture? And and so you, you think about it. When we're mentally aware that we're caught up in a cosmic war, that we know God wins, amen? And we're on the winning side. We, what's great about the Bible is the end of things is in it. We can just flip ahead to the end and say, okay, Whew. right? We win. We win. God wins. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have temptation. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have trials. It doesn't mean we're not going to get down with the burden and care of life. But at the same time, if, if, if we know that God has ministering spirits out there for us, called angels, they're there to minister to us while we're, while we're here on this earth still. 
I don't think we're going to need them when we get to heaven, do you? I don't think we're going to need them for that. Matter of fact, the Bible says that we're going to judge angels at one place. So, you know, all this stuff that goes into that, and you think about these creatures. If, you know, a lot of people don't, can't, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. You ever met somebody like that? I had an atheist tell me one time that he didn't believe in God. I said, why don't you believe in God? He said, I don't believe in anything I can't see. And I'm like, do you have a mind? Yeah, I've got a mind. Have you seen it? But you believe you got one, don't you? It's funny how people use those silly excuses. Um, I actually convinced an atheist one time in a teaching um, to be an agnostic. So I got him that much closer, right? <laughs> because he, he, he was a 19-year-old, and he's an atheist. You know, he was just, he, had, he was studying Dawkins, and he was studying all these atheist teachers out there. So he had his, he had his ready defense of what he believes. So we got to talking, and I said, well... I understand you've got all these angles, you've read all these books and all these philosophers, and I, and I understand that. I said, but I still think that atheism is an ignorant, wisdomless stance. And, of course, he was highly offended because he thought himself of great intellect. And I told him, I said, you're probably more intellectual than I am, but let me, let me say this. You're saying there is no God as an atheist. He said, correct, there is no God. I said, so for you to prove that, let's, let's just take your inference to the nth degree, for you to prove that, for you to be able to say, because he also thought of himself as a scientist. I said, for you to say there is no God, you would have to have been everywhere all at once, which is an interesting God trick that nobody else can do, to be omnipresent, so that you can look under every rock and on every planet and on everything that's out there in the known and unknown universe. You'd have to see it all at one time because God could hide. When you're on Mars, he could run over to Jupiter and you'd never find him. So you've got to be at Mars and Jupiter so that God can't do that for you to say there is no God. I said a wiser stance for you to say is you're agnostic, which means you can't know. And so by the end of the, end of the service, the people that, he, that brought him to church, they drove home, they, they worked at a camp, and it was a long drive for them. Before they ever got back to the camp that night, um, he was an agnostic. So, <laughs> so at least he's now saying, I can't know. Uh, he may be back all the way convinced that there is no God, but at that point in his life, he, he was saying, I can't know. Well, if you're saying you can't know, that leaves a little room for doubt, doesn't it? It leaves a little room for God to work in his life. And that, that, see, that's what, that's what I believe the angels do. I think even those appointed for salvation to inherit salvation, which I think means human beings, that part of their role is to be influencers in our life so that when the gospel is presented and the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life, we begin to receive that gospel. Because I think that God works in our life. And I also believe that the other side works as well. And, and a lot of times it, it can take our mind. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to, to win like a 55-year-old man to the Lord? Versus like a 5-year-old child or a 7-year-old child or a 9-year-old child. You can tell them about God. And it's like they're so accepting and so receiving. But what we do is we grow older and we get more jaded. And we grow more doubt and we begin to have these arguments against God. And what we're doing, we're just blocking out his influence in our life. We're basically saying when we begin to get jaded and hard, we're beginning to say exactly what God says he cannot forgive, which is we're beginning to say, I reject you. And, and he'll let you reject. He won't force himself on anybody. It's a free will thing. And, and we begin to, you know, we don't like the idea of a God out there. A lot of times we don't like, we like the idea of God and we like the idea of heaven. We don't like the idea of hell. And we don't like the idea of anybody telling us we can't do what we want to do. And so when the Bible says thou shalt not, we take offense at that. Well, we're going to do it my way. Well, you don't understand. This is how I was born. Or I've got this tendency. Or, I've got this trait. Or God's this cosmic killjoy. And what we begin to do when we see people actually reject God. And I believe that there are angels demons, fallen angels, all of that's involved in that the whole time. See, so that's why the preaching of the gospel and the prayer, prayer of the preaching of the gospel and the prayer for the church and prayer for the worship and prayer for the singing of song. You know, the singing of the song. How many times do we sing a song? It's got the gospel in it. It's got the truth of Jesus Christ in it. It's got the truth of what it means to be in Christ. And the whole time, um, as Jesus said, the sower was sowing seed and some fell on the hard path. And it says the birds of the air came and got that. And they, the disciples said, what do you mean by that? Jesus said, the, the, the birds of the air are, are the fallen angels. And, and they come and they steal that seed that's been spread. As, as the preaching and the teaching of the gospel goes out, it's like seed, the Bible says. It's a metaphor. And as it lands on certain lives that are hard, before it can ever do anything, 
the fowls of the air come and steal that seed. So it doesn't take root. It doesn't grow. And, and people don't lean into Christ. And hard-packed earth becomes hard-packed earth, becomes hard-packed earth, becomes roads, becomes paved roads. And, and, and if you take that metaphor to this, it's as far as you can stretch with it, it gets harder and harder and harder for somebody to receive that. But it says the birds of the air actually come and steal that. And Jesus attributes that to the evil one. Um, so that's, that's all the verses I had for this evening, just thinking about what it, what, when we think about an angel, what, what comes to mind? Does, you know, frilly, uh, little cherubs, little bows, wings, all those things. Now, the Revelation does, again, talking about an angel, said an angel flew around the sky preaching the everlasting gospel. Um, but it still, even at that point, doesn't say flew with wings. It's just flying around the air. They can go from God's realm to our realm pretty quick. So I don't, I, you know, if you're thinking physically, I don't know how wings would do in space. Of course, angelic wings would do pretty good, I guess. But they move in such a way, in such a speed, that it's not about them flapping with wind gust and, and getting lift and, and all those other things. That they're, they're not tied to this physical world as we are. But they can appear, and they appear a lot of times as a man. And they appear a lot of times in our times of need. And what I like about that is no matter how long it took Gabriel to get to Daniel, God knows our need way before we have it, doesn't he? And he can make provision for whatever we need, what, however angels are involved and however the Holy Spirit's involved. God is actually orchestrating. I like that word, orchestrating in our life, uh, our outcome, our choices, our, our results. He's, he's working. Sometimes we go through tough times because God's in the middle of, of training us and teaching us and and resolving the right mindset and, and the right approach to life. And so, as you consider angels, we're going to look at cherubim and seraphim and, and, and maybe one more order that's listed in Scripture, but it's debatable, in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to kind of look at some different things that people believe or think about angels or, or these other beings and, and what the Bible actually has to say about how they look. And so we're going to have some interesting pictures next week. Come back. We're going to look at... We're going to look at cherubim next week, and, and I think they're quite terrifying. Um, wouldn't want to run into one. So they, they do their job well. They guard things, and they do their job well. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a time of discussion. Father, tonight in Jesus' name, thank you that we could be here. Thank you that you've given us the word. And, Father, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament alike, there's so many more references of, of what we're told about angels, this one level of heavenly being that's represented in scripture. Father, your messengers, and we thank you that you have your messengers and that they have their task, and, and we're part of their task, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you've made provision for all that we need. Father, I pray that this teaching tonight would open our mind to the things that you have provided according to our needs so that we would see this and be thankful. Father, the, the goal is to worship you greater, to praise you more, and to be thankful in our life for all that you provided. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.